Hey guys. So you know, kind of crazy. You've been uh, doing this a little while. I actually never made it out to Raleigh. So uh, holy crap, Raleigh was a thing. <laughs> Wait, my my friend had the greatest pun of all. Of all. I'm like, sorry, I can't go to your thing. I'm you know going off to Raleigh. He's like, uh, ah yes, the great Raleigh scattering. Six jokes. So anyway, thinking like, how long have I been doing this? Like, ah. All right, everyone. Who wants to save the internet? Yeah, I've been doing this long enough that that, that used to be cool. Man, like, the internet used to be like a thing people liked. I finally figured out why everyone's all into like Heartbleed and Shell Shock. They're like, man, maybe this one will finally kill that thing. Yeah. The internet used to be cool. Now it's that thing you go on Facebook and find out your kid, their kids are cuter than your kids. Anyway, the stuff I've been thinking about lately. Uh, it is kind of a weird field to be in, in information security. Because um, uh, we keep getting our butts kicked. And it only feels a little different. Like, oh, you know, maybe we look at, you know, if only people would stop using PHP, you wouldn't have a security problem. Huh? And they never do. Never actually goes away. Like, you turn around, it's 2014, it's the same stuff over and over and over again. Didn't we fix SQL injection like a decade ago? But now we have, you know, Drupal getting term of the freaking hour. So security is a weird field. It's a weird field because we keep getting our butts kicked. We gotta try to go ahead, make things work, if we can. And you're never quite sure who actually wants you to succeed. And on that depressing note, so um, I want to talk to you guys about a couple of various techniques and technologies that I've been playing with. And uh, it's not that I'm saying they're the most important things in the world to worry about, but there are reasons why I'm thinking about this stuff, and I'm going to try to explain them to you. So start off with an interesting scenario, kind of a weird one. Attackers compromise the system. They put something on the hard drive. How bad could it be? What's the worst the bad guy could do? Could they, you know, put a daemon on, you know, some root kit that'll launch every time, or play some core operating system files? Maybe they'll play it really old school and put a virus in the master boot record. Ha ha ha. So, what do you do to fix this? Theoretically, we're here in information security to try to fix stuff. What do you do to remediate? Well. Can you just wipe out the drive and be done? By the way, is this microphone actually working for people? Can you guys hear me? Mostly. Okay. I'm trying to think. This one is on. No, it's not. Mic is weird. All right. So I want to talk about this stuff because this particular scenario has the highest differential between people who do offense and people who do defense. More accurately, I'm going to talk about stuff that is utterly ancient in some worlds and utterly unknown in others. So, what is the difference between a hard drive and a brick? Anyone? Power connector. <laughs> well played. <laughs> If I had Coronas to give out, I would be giving you one for that. <laughs> the actual difference between a hard drive and a brick is, uh, given sufficient research, there is no difference between a hard drive and a brick. You will turn one into the other, as I have learned very expensively. Um, theory versus reality. <coughs> what is a hard drive? Hard drive is a thing, you put bits in, you get bits out, that's it, right? No, no, no. Call it exhibits iron law of computer architecture. Yo dog, I heard you like computers, so I put a computer in your computer so you can compute while you compute. This is basically how computers work. We find some job that's difficult. I don't know, managing the piles of bits and error correction and layout and temperature 
management and error management and smart. Like the amount of stuff in a hard drive, hard drives actually have really complicated operating systems. I know you can extract them. Um, and so what we basically do is we take all of those programs and we shove them in another computer and we take that computer and we put it in yours. And that's a hard drive. Um, this stuff used to be done with dedicated circuitry. We don't really do that anymore. You know, your iPhone has seven ARM processors because it was easier and cheaper to just have seven more CPUs in there than to make seven chips from scratch. The biggest lie about your computer is that it's just one computer. So, what do you think happens if you take some other computer, put it in yours, and give it direct access to your memory so that everything is nice and fast? What did you expect was gonna happen? Things that are fast, things that are trusted, things come insecure. So, let me actually show you what happens when you start playing around with hard drives. I did this project with Travis Goodspeed a few years ago. Let's go ahead and get shell on a hard drive. You can do that. There's an actual straight up OS in there, and uh, it's meant for you to use it. You ever wonder what happens when you send the hard drive out to go get repaired by OnTrack? Well, they've got like, you know, nice little user interface, memory control commands, all self-documenting, you know, hit E to spin down and reset drive, M to, oh, I always like editing processor memory words. Uh, you can get internal drive metadata, learn about the disk you know about. By the way, there's an extra system partition. People are like, hey, you know, I cleared everything with the hard drive. It's like, yeah, there's more storage in there. They realize pretty quick they're putting gigabytes on and make them wrong. Just keep a little space for himself. Even when you read out the contents directly, very nice and convenient. What was really fun is when we were uh, taking apart the Seagate code, we actually got all their test logs because they actually write the test logs back to the hard drive, uh, which is really fun because you get you know stuff like, what is the WTF bin score, you know? <laughs> yes, I don't know who you are, Python guy, but I feel you. Um, I don't think you need like a serial link to, uh, to exploit any of this stuff. Um, it's always funny, people are like, yeah, you know, someone could attack the persistent storage on the device, you know, the, the BIOSes, the Ethernet BIOS, the hard drive. But that would be like complicated tools. I'm like, have you heard about like, you know, ask get, install HDPARM? You know, have you ever like run that command and grepped it for extremely dangerous? Because that is the most fun thing that you can search for in any documentation. Um, yeah, just command line tools. I'll go ahead and uh, at minimum brick your hard drive, like reliably. Hard drive research is really fun. You'll actually spend like $75 on a new hard drive like every few minutes. Like, nope, that command didn't work. <laughs> what, do you think I was kidding about the bricking? <laughs> so this eventually led to a paper. Uh, implementation and implications of a stealth hard drive backdoor. Bunch of people did a lot of work. I was an undivided co-conspirator. Basically, I just spent a lot of money. Um, and they spent 10 months doing solid reverse engineering to actually build a malicious firmware payload, a, a hard drive that if it was present in a machine, your machine would get reinfected, whether or not you formatted it, cleared it, maybe set it back to factory specifications. Not at all new. This stuff has been going on since there's been hard drives, okay? This is you know, ancient, but from a defensive standpoint, does anyone think about this stuff? I mean, outside of the world where your hard drives have been getting owned regularly and you've been getting busted for it. We have these huge gaps between what is actually, not even just possible, but what is wildly well known in small communities and what we actually do defensively. Because really, what would we do defensively? There's some magic thing we could do to hard drives to make them unexploitable. So, I bring this up to bring up a concept called, I, I've called storage XOR execution. This would be a highly desirable property for secure clouds. The basic idea is as follows. A device either parses a bunch of code, processes it, works on it, does stuff, let's face it, gets owned, XOR, it stores data. 
It stores bits. It has a long-term persistence. You can do one, you can do the other, you can't do both. I actually built a bunch of stuff around this concept. And it was way too early. And it completely failed. We have this very interesting situation in InfoSec where you're only allowed to be a certain amount ahead of the curve. Even when problems are obvious, that's not enough. It's not enough for them to be obvious to a small community. It's not enough for them to be a real problem for a few people. They have to be part of this larger zeitgeist. And it is infuriating from an engineering perspective. You're like, man, you guys are like trying to remediate? You guys are, you're talking about like bios attacks? I got like eight other places to put my malware. But we can't have these discussions. We're not. Problem is, is that it's actually correct. We can't solve the obvious problems that we have. We certainly don't get to go ahead and try to solve like the hard drive issues. And that's kind of the situation. So, what is the value of hacker engineering? We have no delusions. Those of us who actually break stuff have, are remarkably good at actually knowing what systems are capable of. We break assumptions. There's a lot of things. There's like, well, I don't want to deal with that problem. I've got, you know, we're going to, ah, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to explain this. Everyone who goes in to pen testing finds out a few things. One thing we find out is, man, social engineering works every time. <laughs> kind of a personal story. So, one of my first, uh, one of my first security jobs. Actually, this was my first security job out of college. I'm the junior on a gig. Senior comes to me and says, "Okay, we're uh, we're going to go ahead and break into this place." And I'm like, "Okay." She's like, "Shut up. Follow me. Everything will be fine." So we walk into this place. They got like triple razor wire, high fences. Looks pretty scary. But you know, I was told, "Shut the hell up." And uh, okay. So we walk in, receptionist is like, can I help you? We're like, no, keep walking. <laughs> and that's how we broke into that facility. <laughs> and you know, I was so, I was actually heartbroken. I'm like, I thought we were gonna do something awesome. There's gonna be some rappelling. I, I, I don't know how I pull myself up the rope, but it'd be fun to try. He's like, no, nah, Dan, look, you know, Someone walks in like that and doesn't have time for the receptionist. One time out of 10,000, it's someone trying to break in. 9,999 times, it's someone who's way too important to be stopped, and if you stop them, you as the receptionist are going to get fired because you were just supposed to know. And the thing is, is that people actually know. They actually do this calculation in their head. Social engineering works because there are always exceptions. And if you actually fail as closed as you'd actually need to do to solve a lot of social engineering attacks, your company fails. Everyone will shoot each other. This is also the problem without doing a lot of things that would deal with insider attacks. Yeah, there are employees that you can't trust. But if you treat all your employees like you can't trust them, you're gonna have more employees that you can't trust. <laughs> more than you started with. Man, the worst is when like, you know, the whole, oh, you gotta frog step someone out of your company. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen anyone do. Like, oh, you know, you're letting someone go, you should let them go with some dig with dignity. Because there's a decent chance they know something about how your company works. Not they know like they're gonna attack you, like they're gonna to need to go back to them and find out some stupid little password. And their consulting rates are gonna be really high. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about random number generators. This is a totally not, uh, someone had this great comment, they're like, Dan, how did you get, 
a thousand people to sit through a talk at DEF CON about random number generators. I'm like, I don't know. Um, it's a great quote. The generation of random numbers is too important to be left to chance. Um, many, many processes require a generator of unpredictable numbers. What does that actually mean? Actually, this is, does have a meaning in a security sense. People are like, oh, randomness has, it's too philosophical. I don't really know what you mean when you say random. No, there's actually a concrete thing. It means if I've got a thousand numbers, I don't get the next one. If I've got a thousand numbers, I don't get the one a thousand one ago. That's actually what we mean by random. It means I don't get to figure out from any existing information something I'm not supposed to know, either in advance or historical. Go ahead. You are talking pseudorandom, right? So it turns out it doesn't matter. It actually doesn't. And I'll, we'll go into the details of it. But for the purposes of applied computer security, it's the non-predictability property. Because let's actually dig into this for a second. Why not? What are you doing when you're attacking a system that has a bad random number generator? You're saying, aha, I'm not supposed to know that the secret is 839, but because I got a bunch of other information, I know the secret is 839, so now I have unauthorized access. It doesn't matter whether it is a pseudo-random solution or a true random solution that prevents me from knowing 839. What matters is that I fail. And unfortunately, people aren't failing very much. Because look at what's actually happening in the field. When you actually look at the, a big thing that I worry about is, what are the constant bugs that keep biting us, that keep showing up? Because this implies we might be fixing them the wrong way. I go ahead and I look online and I see, well, there's PHP dying, and there's Python dying, and there's you know, Perl dying. Like, why do I keep seeing all of these languages failing. So all this stuff ends up really breaking in, breaking web stuff. Here's why. Uh, you don't actually log in that frequently to most web services. Um, a friend of mine actually used to run security at a top 10 e-commerce site. And uh, by the way, maybe something that has time on it, because I don't know what time it is. Um, top 10 e-commerce site, like really one of the largest sites on the net, we were talking about how often there are logins on the site. Like there are seven a site. And I'm like, wait, throughout your entire international biggest thing in the world? He's like, seven times a second someone puts in a password. However, every other time they put in a password once long ago and there's a cached cookie on their machine and that is the password equivalent. That's the thing that's being provided day in, day out, page in, page out. Um, now, if you're lucky, that cookie has an HMAC, who you are with some secret key. In the real world, that value, that is password equivalent, is random. <laughs> sure would suck if that random thing that's password equivalent is not actually random and you can predict it by looking at like a thousand other logins. I mean, like, oh, Here's login number 1001. This is a thing that totally, totally happens all the time. Uh, one out of 200 RSA keys were found to be non-random by, by a recent really elegant scan. Um, this is a time bomb. This is worked by Nadia Henninger. She does terrifying things to that. Um, the trick she used using some math of greatest common denominators, will find you RSA keys that have precisely equivalent primes. So if you have P1, P2, and Q, and so that gives you now, you know, P1 times Q is N1, P2, P2 times Q is N2. You're doing some GCDs on N1 and N2, and you end up with P1, PQ, P2, and Q. So take that, and instead of one and two, all primes on the internet, like all of them, or all prime composites, or products. Her stuff finds identical matches. But if there's a single bit difference, it doesn't work. <laughs> this is actually really scary, 
because we know that there's one out of 200 that are identical. It means there's actually some huge number that are not identical, but are almost. You know, we've got like a thousand bits. If 99.1% of them are different, it'll break GCD, but it'll still be crackable. So what's not causing this situation? And actually, sorry, I just always need to know what time I'm at. All right, so how did we not get here? It's not because we're not using the wrong cryptographic functions or because we're using some entropy for too long. We have all these theories for why random number generators are failing. Here's why they're actually failing. One, we do need to start with some entropy. We need some bits. We need like 128. Ever. Over the course of the device's lifetime, you need 128 bits once. People are like, how do we get gigabytes a second? It's like, no, I don't need gigabytes, I need 16. That's it. There's no mega, giga, just 16 bytes is fine. 16 times 8 is 128. Like, please let me have done that math right. Yes. <laughs> um, the other problem is that our default APIs suck. So, the actual entropy problem. How do we get here? Um, earlier, someone said, are you talking about true random number generators or pseudo random number generators? Well, a, uh, um, uh, the difference between the two is basically given, so a true random number generator will just spit out bits. And as far as we know, there are no, there is no fundamental structure that is the ultimate key to those bits. They just happen as a function of the universe. There's actually a lot of ways to get bits that are a function of the universe. Apparently, God does play dice. Einstein was wrong. <laughs> However, as cool as these techniques are, and I tell you, there's some super cool hardware out there, uh, we don't really need them. Given 128 bits of values you can't predict, you can basically extend that indefinitely. So you don't need to keep asking the universe. You asked it once, and you can just keep running that over in a giant loop, and it's never going to fail on you. It will never actually fail in an applied cryptographic sense. Um, but you know, 128 bits, go ahead. So when KeePass, for example, when KeePass asked me to, when I got up a password, it says, uh, please type in randomly on your keyboard and move your mouse around. That, that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to do a random seed for the password generation. Yes. So, what is specifically happening, by the way, my, sorry. I don't know why. Anyway. So, question was, when KeePass goes ahead and you guys have a mic, you heard the question. Here's what's actually happening. It's actually really cool once you see where true randomness is coming from. Um, all true randomness, well, okay, most true randomness is extracted from the difference between clocks. You have a system with a really fast clock and a system with a really slow clock that are not synchronized. When you measure one within the other, the fact that there's flop is where the randomness comes from. Specifically, you take a human who runs on, humans run on a time scale of milliseconds. So maybe small numbers of milliseconds, maybe hundreds of milliseconds, but it's a millisecond scale. When you measure a millisecond system at nanosecond precision, you get bits of entropy. That is actually what's going on. The, the entire idea is no matter how hard you try, as a human being made out of meat, you actually can't fail to, uh, uh, within nanosecond tolerances. So all these systems tend to be interactions between slow and fast clocks. Problem is, is that, yes, there are absolutely systems where there's a human sitting there. You'd be like, hey dude, can you like get the keys of it? Because like your slow ass hands are like really useful right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've got this entire universe of embedded devices 
There is no mouse, keyboard, human, there's no spinning disc. There's a cute trick where you're like, aha, well the disc is interacting with molecules of air, so you know that that's gonna get us some some randomness. Um, nice theory. There's also not a spinning disc. It's a hunk of inert silicon with electricity going through it. What are you gonna do? So we have fixes. We're just really afraid to use them. Um, like I said, all these systems are slow clocks versus fast clocks. You know, I told you earlier with hard drives, there's more than one computer in every computer. Even your most glorious system on a chip architectures, still, you tend to have multiple clocks floating around there somewhere. Ideally, we wouldn't need to hack this stuff out, right? Like, ideally, there's a lot of ways to get silicon to give you a buggy sequence of bits. Like, you kind of got to work to make silicon not do that. Um, for whatever reason, I guess for testability, um, hardware tends, CPUs tend not to come with actual random number generators. And it's okay, because even when they do come with random number generators, we refuse to trust them. One guy laughs, like, no, <laughs> like, Intel finally put, <coughs> excuse me, Intel finally did put a random number generator in inside of their latest CPUs, and people were like, no, I refuse to trust it. Like, but you finally got what you wanted. You've wanted this for decades. Yeah, but who knows how they implemented it. And then, you actually look at the report that Intel put out about how their random number generator worked. And it was, the report was done by Cryptography Research, great company. And you just, you, you just got a face palm. Because the report's like, well, they told us it worked this way. They wouldn't actually let us use any of the hardware. All the debugging code that they showed us being used, they disable that in production. So there's no real way to verify anything at all in this report. And I'm like, this is totally unnecessary. You did not need to be sketchy bastards here. <laughs> Thank you, Intel. Anyway, the reality is, is you need to find some other clock that is slower than your CPU clock to go ahead and measure. And then you're basically saying, you're not a human hand, but I'm running at nanosecond and you're running at high microsecond, I can still measure within your tolerances. I don't need much, I just need a few bits. Remember, I only need like 128 bits ever. We kept thinking that we needed like massively high speed random number generators. Like no, let me go ahead and do this terribly slowly because I'm only gonna do it once. It's fine. I didn't invent this, this technique. Uh, Matt Blaze figured it out in 96. There are a bunch of ways of measuring, you know, the reliability of a bunch of stuff at uh, uh, the Unix scheduling was actually not great. So if you go ahead and you measure that not great reliability and a second scale, you end up with a slow clock and a fast clock. Empirically, it works. Now here's what's great. This approach can fail. Totally can. Like, I found environments where it fails. Like, you know, I need an Arduino, but like, you know, Given a sufficient microcontroller environment, you can fail here. Will it fail to the point that it, gen that it generates one out of 200 RSA keys badly? No. <laughs> if we had done this in 1996, would one out of 200 RSA keys have been generated badly? No. We are um, we're a little bit absolutist in security. If it is not absolutely 100% Completely and utterly perfect, it must be worthless. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. All we're finding in terms of really effective mitigations is they don't always work. Oh well. You know what? Sometimes address space layout randomization does not stop the exploit. But you know what? Sometimes it really does. Sometimes it stops every possible exploit. Sometimes it stops every possible exploit from an entire class of attacker. Sometimes an attacker can't get an exploit to always work. 
Now this is an interesting final case. Let's forget to bring this up, but it's a big deal. Like, there are a bunch of attackers for whom if they don't have 100% success rates, they don't do the attack. That's our job here, to get the attack to not happen. I don't care how much you cheat to get it. You get to cheat. It's your network. You go make the rules. Do whatever it takes to keep the bad guys out. This isn't math. We get to cheat way more. So that's kind of the situation with getting strong randomness. I, I forgot to mention. I, so I actually have a package called Dockerand. It uses various methods of playing clocks against one another. If you want to actually play with this stuff for real, go find Dockerand. It's a lot of fun. And someday we'll figure out how to actually make a you know, sufficiently mathy proof that people can feel like it's been proved. I don't know about you guys, but like, the more times I, like, God, I'm gonna hate myself for saying this. Every time I hear the word proof, I reach for my gun. <laughs> like, I love proofs, but man, I've seen way too many that are contradictory and they can't all be axiomatically true. Um, there are systems that prove insecurity. Now, that's totally different. Like. Proving vulnerabilities is being an incredibly valid and useful thing. Like, you'll have code that just finds these crazy paths. Like, you know, when the input is seven and, you know, the phase of the moon is gibbous, you get buffer overflows. It's great. Um, so proving vulnerabilities has worked well. Proving safety has not. But there's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is even if we were going ahead and getting strong random numbers. Even if we were feeding just those 128 bits, we had them, they're in our hand. We can do the math forever that no one will ever be able to predict or break. We could, but we're not. You look at the actual APIs that are out there for people to do random number generation, and whether it's math random or Ruby's random or Java util random or PHP RAND, or for the love of God, glibc RAM. we have really fast math for generating really secure streams of random numbers, and we're never using them. Instead, we ask people to use these complicated special case APIs that are all kinds of funky, instead of math random in JavaScript, you call new in, new in 32 array, window, crypto, get random values. Why are we doing this to people? We leave the easy and crappy API sitting right there, as insecure as it's been since the 90s, and then we've got this super perfect API that people don't use, and we wonder why we're getting them. Which API does dev use? The easy one. Why are we being insecure by default? Turns out security by default also impacts APIs and what's available. So, I had an idea from one of my coworkers. Um, instead of requiring some really funky magic and consistently overcomplicated API for secure randomness, what if we just took the calls that people were calling and made them not horrifyingly insecure. <laughs> like, you know, kind of how we fix most things. Uh, so we've, we've been working on something called LibUrandy. We are basically hijacking the standard randomness functions in all the major common languages and backing them with devuRandom or a crypt gen random on Windows. Like, look, there are actually other, well, you know, we have an operating system level, generally pretty good random number generator why don't we just feed that into the APIs that devs want to call and call it a day? Turns out this isn't very hard to do. We've gotten it done for JavaScript, Ruby, uh, libc, PHP, Python. Uh, we're putting it into OpenJDK. Um, kind of nice. So what's wrong with this? I, uh, I like playing chess against myself, so humor me. Um, there are two things that are wrong with silently replacing randomness with, uh, uh, well, silently just silently replacing crap randomness with something that won't actually get you owned. 
Um, well, the most important thing isn't on this slide is that you just can't assert your moral superiority over developers anymore. Like you can't just be like, you use the easy API, therefore you're a bad human being, and I'm better than you for having noticed your incorrect API use. What the hell are we supposed to put in our pen test reports? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, seating. Yes, there's a small number of situations where even though you want the stream of information to be random-ish, in other words, to keep hopping around lots of, you know, all the possible numbers you can get, ones and zeros, um, you want the same numbers. So you want the same sequence of random-ish data. So you start from a seed, you want to be able to have the same seed from time to time to time. Um, it's very easy to do when you control the seed, put in the number. Um, it's tricky to do when you're asking the operating system to do it. For some reason, operating systems don't give you an API to just be like, hey, dev, you random, what if you stopped being good? Like they, you know, no one has ever asked them to do that to their credit. Um, okay, this is a use that some testers need. We can special case it because I'll take a special case load on the test guy who's smart in exchange, I won't have every website that I'm seeing out there vulnerable to some session prediction vulnerability. A bigger complaint, a much more relevant complaint, is actually that uh, uRandom is not the fastest thing in the world. Um, it turns out that generating, generating random numbers poorly is insanely fast. Um, and for whatever reason, you random is not. Uh, you know, we're talking about you know one to five percent of the speed of the insanely fast stuff. Um, and this is actually a major reason why. Actually, as far as I can tell, this is the reason why everyone keeps using what are called the linear feedback shift registers or the percent twister uh, benchmarks. Somewhere, somehow, calling math random gets into a benchmark, and now it's really important that it be fast. And who cares if it's secure? You want secure, use the hard to use API. Big reason this is a huge failure as it happens is there is a dream, there's a claim that you will know when you need your randomness to be secure and when it's okay for it to be as fast as possible. And Man, we can't even predict what strings are going to be going into bash and I have to not execute code. <laughs> you think we know this? No, I mean, there are situations where you actually know you're not going to be crossing security boundaries and having predicted, like a, from the graphics world. Okay, I'm going to go generate a million particles at random locations in, in space. Pretty sure that's not coming in from a website. Pretty sure that's just going to a graphics card. No security implications. People don't want that case to be strong. That is reasonable. However, our software and our APIs are being dominated, and our pain points, our bug points are being dominated. Um, there's a lot of these security vulnerabilities. And it's really expensive when these sites get hacked. So, it turns out we could be faster than you random. You random on Linux has a bunch of weird little quirks to it. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a funky design. Um, if you go ahead and use either um, uh, SIP hash or Skyne, the latter of which actually, so all hash functions can easily be turned into uh, cryptographically secure pseudo random number generators for all the debate on what the absolute best CES PRNG is, they're pretty much all good. No, really. They, like, our buffer for, like, once you use any good cryptographic function, and in fact, most of the bad ones, our buffer for security is amazing. That the dot, like, that this has even been a debate is crazy. No, no, the only thing that's really different is of the various CES PRNGs, how fast can we make them so that we get both nearly the speed of uh, LFSR 
and we get um, the actual security of you know, any of the good functions. If you can be performant, you can be on by default. And if you can be on by default, you can secure more. And that's our goal, right? So that's kind of what I've had to say about random numbers. Two other things I wanted to talk about. Um, well, shoe finally dropped. Who here likes making fun of Java? Anyone? Java. Oracle basically just said to screw it. Basically, every time you try to install a security update, Java tries to install the apps.com toolbar. <laughs> like, you know, is this a multi billion dollar corporation or is this a bunch of jackasses down the street? I can't tell. <laughs> It's really not good. Um, I'm not sure where that's actually going to go. Like, I think this is going to end up with the browsers actively blocking ask.com toolbar as malware. And you know what? Who's with me? I think we should just declare it. All right, I'm going to basically say I'm in a room full of security engineers, and we're building world market malware. Sweet. I'm blaming you guys. The community of p sides reality has spoken. <laughs> um, so guys, you know, jokes aside, uh, how is it that IE, which Microsoft has been working to secure for like, I mean seriously a decade, um, how is it that IE has finally started having more actual attacks in the field than Java, which you know we love making fun of? So. If you actually look inside of Internet Explorer, um, IE is, like, remember that whole lawsuit where Microsoft was like, we can't remove IE, IE is Windows is IE. And everyone was like, that's ridiculous, IE is just a program, you don't need to ship a program with Windows, it's just a program. No. <laughs> IE is Windows, the remix, featuring the internet. When you look inside, and I have, it really is, well, the internet needs a JPEG parser, we got a JPEG parser. The internet needs an object model, we got an object model. They basically took their own local native, super hyper trusted, if it's buggy, it gets to crash architecture and said, HTML, have at it. <laughs> so yes, shockingly, it's taken them a decade to try to get this into some degree of security because the underlying architecture was never designed with the idea that you had a malicious, be like having a malicious person sitting at the desk running commands at a command prompt. Like, aha, uh -huh, someone can type format C. Like, yes, they're, they're at the command prompt. What do you mean you're putting a command prompt on the internet? Um, so that's kind of what happened. And it turns out that the way that the underlying architecture, this massively flexible object model that JavaScript ends up exposing, ends up causing not just IE, but all the browsers to look really similar inside. Um, at this point, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with and breaking all of the browsers. And um, I tell you, they're not that different. Um, the, the, uh, you know, I've got an object model, I've got stuff I can call, I've got APIs, it's got a certain number of ways it can be implemented and they're all roughly the same. Um, so we have a sort of universal vulnerability in that all the browsers end up exposing. It's called use after free. Um, <coughs> the general concept of a use after free, <coughs> excuse me, that water was actually super useful. Look, what a web browser is basically doing is constantly generating objects, things, you know, tables or pictures or scripts. You know, there's hundreds of different things that a web browser can gin up and then makes them hook, hooks them up to each other. So you've got a picture, it's on a page. You've got a page, it's part of a browser shell. You've got a browser shell as part of a process. You know. These things have pointers that link to one another. So now you've got a bunch of crap floating around. 
Eventually, you gotta free some memory because you only have a finite amount of it. And so the browsers tend to keep track. Okay, well, I've got stuff. I don't need to store it anymore because nothing else is pointing to it. I can remove it. Um, but it's not just that. It's not just that it's really complicated to know whether you have references to an object or not. It's that the attacker has the ability to actively and programmatically create references and remove them. That you don't normally have. Like, when you're exploiting Office, like, yeah, you're parsing a file. And there's lots of weird stuff you can put into an OLE document, into an Office document. Uh, immense amounts of code can be reached. But you're still parsing it in a linear line. It's not like you have more code, you just get to keep running and running in circles and timing and by the way, maybe even triggering memory management to happen at precise moments. Your flexibility as an attacker is enormous. And so what the action if you screw it up once, what it ends up looking like is there's a pointer to say a table. For whatever reason, the browser thinks there's no more need for that table. So it goes ahead and frees the allocation. It's wrong. There's some other object somewhere, a monkey. A monkey's got a pointer to the, to the table. I wasn't keeping track. Can't trust those monkeys. So now the memory is reused. But it's not reused as a table, it's reused as an image. So OX1234, 1234 now points to an image instead of pointing to uh, pointing to a table. So now, you go back to the monkey, go say, hey monkey, you know that table you got? I wanna run this function on your table. There's, there's an image there, there's no table there. But it's gonna go ahead and jump to the code as if there was a table. And how's it gonna behave? I don't know, but it's probably gonna execute code at some point. <laughs> and that's pretty much this infinite well of browser vulns, I'm not actually joking. Like, think of all the vulnerabilities that have ever been found and realize that there's gonna be a whole lot more vulns that are going to be found in the future. There was some point where the last three years of vulnerabilities hadn't been discovered yet. This undiscovered country has a shape. It has properties to it that can be predicted. It's not random. Like for all we were talking about randomness, the distribution of vulnerabilities, particularly in browser internals, is not a function of rolling the dice. The vast majority of them are use after free because getting this stuff to actually work reliably at all is a huge pain in the butt. Browser test suites are some of the most complicated things on the planet. Do you have any idea what kind of crazy things HTML makes you do? HTML is a language designed around the concept that it should render something. I don't know what, but like, it shouldn't crash. Like, that's actually the fun, like, that was the innovation of HTML. People don't realize this. HTML was the first programming language and even just the first document format that you could literally take your hands and smash the keyboard with them and it would not give you an error. It would render something. Now, you can do that, but there are consequences. It means your system has to be able to do something for all possible inputs. Creates a design that ends up having very hard times precisely knowing how to manage memory. And the thing is, if you manage it bad, if you're too conservative, you run out and then you crash. So you don't want to be too conservative. And uh, for most of the time that these stuff was being implemented, no one was actively exploiting all the use after freeze because hey, job is way easier. You just like call this function and runs whatever you want. Um, it took a while before this became the lowest pole, uh, pole in the uh, in the tent. So this is <coughs> at least ninety percent, maybe ninety five, maybe even ninety eight percent of the undiscovered vulns across all browsers. Like, when you hear people make jokes about WebKit, they're joking about WebKit's vulnerabilities to use after free. Like, man. <laughs> so, I am not the only person talking about this. Both Google and Microsoft are very wisely investing in mitigation technologies that try to globally deal with use after free. 
the Google solution is to have a type heap. So they basically say, no matter what, at least let's make sure tables are allocated over here and images are allocated over here. And now, the attacker can't go ahead and get a image to be allocated where the, the tables are because that's, that's table space, that's not for images. Definite mitigation, definitely useful. Weakness is that, uh, you know, sometimes I may have a table of one state versus a table of another state. So I replace the tables under the second one, but the second one isn't properly initialized yet. So it has some random stuff in it or uncontrolled stuff, it still fails. Doesn't matter. You still massively reduce the scope of the problem. Now the attacker needs to figure out how to have this multi table state as opposed to just every other possible kind of object can now be accessed as if it was a table. So, very nice, very cool. This is actually, I think, in production Chrome now. Microsoft solution is non deterministic freeing. They're, I'm oversimplifying this, but they're basically saying, well, what if the attacker doesn't know when it's safe for them to try to head, try to run their exploit? What if sometimes it takes a minute and sometimes it takes an hour for that swapping to occur? What if it becomes infeasible for the attacker to be able to write a reliable use after free exploit? It might work from time to time, but they can never make it perfectly reliable. I was mentioning earlier, this is cheating and this is good. <laughs> There is nothing better you can do than attacking the unique requirements of your attackers. Because guess what? You have no obligation to provide them a convenient environment for their operations. They have some weaknesses. They require reliability. They don't often, like especially if they're attacking a production environment, they're discovering it in real time. You got there first. You have first move. They have to figure this crap out on the fly. They gotta like sniff it and wash it and monitor it. Like, I'm a big fan of honeypots. Use your attacker's weaknesses against them. Sorry for harping on this, but it's a big point for me. So, I had a trick in this space called Iron Deep, named uh, by Rob Graham, Rob or Rob. You can't use that for free if you don't free memory. <laughs> Now, I know this sounds a little ridiculous. Uh, I'm not talking about leaking actual memory, because that is a finite resource. You've got four gigs, eight gigs, whatnot. Um, much, much less on a mobile phone. So we can't do that for physical memory. But we do have 64-bit systems now. We have gobs of virtual memory. We have a tremendous amount of address space that every process has. It can go off in you know, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. Um, the idea is don't reuse memory addresses. The whole thing about, so the whole thing with how computers work is you have some amount of physical memory. Four gigs, eight gigs, whatnot. What actually is exposed to your programs is not, oh, it's this particular page, this particular location, physical memory. Each process gets its own view, and it's like NAT. It's like, you know, you might have one IP out to the internet, but you've got like 100 inside your network, and it all magically works. Memory management is basically NAT for memory. Like, that's actually what's going on to explain it from a networking standpoint. Um, virtual memory basically means that not even just every each browser, but each browser tab, each component of a browser can have an infinite amount of pointers effectively. So why reuse them? Like, you know, still go ahead and reuse the physical pages of memory because mapping from the virtual to the physical has actual hardware on the CPU. That's what's called the MMU, the memory management unit. So reuse the physical pages and don't reuse the pointers. So the idea is that once you do have something free, some pointer, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, once it's freed, you, it, it doesn't point to any physical memory anymore. Like if you try to go ahead and use that memory for any purpose, 
just comes back and says, no, this isn't mapped to anything. We can exploit that. So there are problems to worry about in terms of efficiency. Um, there are a finite amount of active <laughs> allocations that you're allowed. Like, really fun way to crash Linux is to try to stress out this value. Because it's not documented. No, why would it be documented how many memory allocations you could have? That's crazy talk. It just silently crashes in your face, and you just were supposed to know not to do that. No, really, that's how it works. Um, so you have a certain number of these mappings between virtual pages and, and real pages that the system can support. Um, but you know, we can have a hot list of pages. Like, you know what else is not random? A browser's use of its own memory is not random. You can have the top. 5,000, 10,000 possible memory mappings, and have those be fast. And the rest go through some slightly slower path. You can do that. By the way, there's an old rule for memory allocators that every possible process has to have, you know, memory allocators must be generic and cannot be optimized for specific uses. A browser is an incredibly specific use. It's also the single most exploited part of our networks today. We can do this. We can have a different allocator for browsers. In fact, we tend to. Firefox uses JD malloc because it happens to be a faster way to do things. Like, you can go ahead and optimize for particular use cases when, at the point where entire operating systems are basically thin shells over the browser, the browser really is the operating system and is the new thing to optimize for. Anyway. Implementation stuff, not to nerd out too much here. <laughs> he says now. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of weird ways that you can implement this. The right way is with the kernels to actually deal with the memory, mal memory allocator directly. But God, I hate writing code for kernels. So, so I'm a big fan <laughs> of doing things in user space, of catching seg faults, of off dealing with them manually. I'm not sure what the, uh, the um, final proper way of doing things is going to be, but it's kind of where I'm working towards. Uh, downsides, we have point of proof of concept. I know it works, but uh, uh, the code isn't available yet. And we're really leaning on 64-bit. Like, you absolutely could not do any of this stuff on 32-bit system. What may work today, there is a package called Die Harder. It's an advanced ASLR implementation with out-of-band heat metadata. Um, they're doing a bunch of funky stuff to make use after free very difficult. And there is a browser platform that was not on the list earlier, and that's Firefox. Firefox is right now the lowest tent in the totem pole, or the lowest pole. The lowest pole in the tent? Lowest Ooh. hanging fruit. Lowest hanging fruit, thank you. I'll buy you a beer later. Even useful. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of desire to use uh, to use things like, so Firefox actually is very popular in a lot of very sensitive privacy interested uses because you can actually work on it, you can manipulate it, you can patch it. Um, it's, uh, let's just say, a little bit easier to work with than uh, some aspects of Chrome or Chromium. Um, but in terms of exploitability, it's, uh, it's most of the work that's gone on with mitigations has not yet made its way to Firefox. And so we have to do something about that. Um, and so we do have a scheme called Die Hard that has been benchmarked against Firefox. It has no statistically significant performance impact. Maybe Firefox should be shipping it. <coughs> and I don't mean that like cynically. I mean, we should actually test this and figure out if this is an architectural change that Firefox should make. Um, so we're actually working with the guys behind Die Hard, uh, not least of which because they'll be able to write an actual implementation of Iron Heat way better than I will. Um, and we're actually doing a, um, a really cool thing with the Firefox developers. So check it out. Remember what I was talking about like, the undiscovered bugs? Well, we can simulate the undiscovered bugs by going ahead and taking all the bugs that were discovered from 2012 to 2014 and testing them with the browser that was available at the beginning of 2012. You now have the code that doesn't know its own future. And you can go ahead and throw the future at it. So now you drop a mitigation on the 2012 Firefox and you say, what percentage 
of the then unknown bugs were mitigated by, um, by this particular defense. Oh God, can we get some science up in the stack? Like, this is the kind of stuff we need to start doing. So, um, this, is a, this is sort of an extension of some work that we did with uh, Deja Vu Security called Fuzz Marking, where this was actually really fun. I wish I had this slide here. We took Office, both actual Microsoft Office and Open Office from 2000, 2003, 2007, and 2010, and we gave them the same set of corrupted fuzz inputs. And then we basically said, okay, given these inputs, let's see what happened to the crash rate as these various versions, same inputs got put into different code bases over time. And it's actually really cool because you watch the exploitability fall off a cliff. You watch the exploitability fall off a cliff in order. In other words, bugs are fixed in order of their severity. Um, this sort of empirical, like Microsoft gets a lot of credit for the, their, their software development life cycle. People are like, wow, that thing actually worked. Because um, frankly, we didn't know if it would, right? Um, like we hoped, but you never really know until you see what the actual experience is. And if you just judge on, I don't know, the press, or even worse, like bug reporting data, like you know, we might just be better at finding bugs. Like that will happen over time too. Doesn't mean the code is getting worse, it's just you're getting smarter at finding attacks. So this was a really good validation that no, we're actually writing code better now. And we're finding bugs faster. Um, and we can watch it going backwards. So this is a new extension of fuzz marking that we're trying to do. We're trying to say, can we measure the strength of a mitigation using um, using vulnerabilities that are discovered after a particular fact. I'm not sure. I actually don't know what the result is gonna be of this research, but um, that's why it's called research. So, <coughs> excuse me. The, uh, the last thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is DDoS. You know, I, I really thought that we were done with this. Like, we got all the stupid kids off the internet and could like, Yeah, yeah. And kids keep getting into high school. <laughs> the net connections just get faster. Who gave that kid fiber? <laughs> so we had a single 100 gigabit flood in 2013. We had 114 more than thus far, I think by mid this year. Um, I think there was just a 237 gigabit flood. Um, the problem is, is that for most of the history of dealing with DDoS, we've been dealing with it through brute force. We just got bigger and bigger pipes. The problem is that we keep giving the other side bigger and bigger pipes too. <laughs> and uh, you know, this ends up being a war that we have to lose. Uh, so for a while, we could model DDoSes as just botnets firing their hordes of machines at some poor web server. And it seemed like what was really happening a lot, but what's been happening with the largest and most damaging floods is no. The, the super old school attacks with spoofed net and internet traffic, reflecting off of internet DNS servers and NTP servers. Like no DNS that involved, just DNS itself is, uh, is really causing a lot of trouble. And it's important to understand why. So, Rumor has it I know a little bit about graphics, but not, not these slides. Uh, so here's a network. There are lots of routes around the core and the center. Uh, fewer routes from each source to each destination. So when you have a normal communication, it tends to follow, you know, okay, it's gonna go down this route, it's gonna go down this route, it's gonna go down this route. You know, bandwidth is limited to the maximum available bandwidth for the slowest of those hops. So, you know, if this particular hop is constrained to one megabit, that is the fastest that particular stream can go, no matter if it's 100 megabit coming in from the source. You guys with me? All right. So let's look at what happens where, um, where you have a, a reflected and spoofed packet stream. What happens is 
is that this guy over here, he goes ahead, so this is the source, he's pretending to be the destination. He's pretending to be this guy over here. And he's gonna go ahead and he's going to appear to send requests to a host up here, a host over here, a host over here, a host over here. His requests are going to spread out. So the sum of all of the links that he can get to is how much bandwidth he gets out. And then all of those replies, which by the way can be somewhat bigger than the request, all of those replies can take all of these other paths to get to this guy over here. So where you end up getting congestion is in all of these possible intake areas. It's not just that we're getting hundreds of gigabits of traffic, it's that the traffic is distributed across all of these links. And it's coming from a relatively small number of sources, but it's a pain in the butt to find. So ideally, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to fake your sources. And there are specs that try to go ahead and achieve that, and you know, it'd be nice. If they always work, but they don't. Can we do more? Um, this is an old, <coughs> an old idea, at least 12 or 13 years old. Um, the basic idea is every once in a while when you forward a packet, you also say, hey, I'm this router, I'm here. I think that I'm going ahead and sending some traffic to you. And here's who I am, and here's who I think I'm forwarding this for. You don't do it all the time. Do it one out of 100,000 packets. Do it one out of a million packets. The idea is that it's basically zero impact on everyday operations. But if you start getting millions of packets a second, you start getting dozens of tracers a second. And that is incredibly useful, because right now it's a pain in the butt to trace all these attacks. What if it wasn't? What if every single attack came with a nice little stream of data that said, Here's who's causing your headaches. Here's who you have to call. Here's how you shut these guys down. Like, that would be nice. Um, I'm about out of time, but there is one cute little thing. It is a bit of a headache to figure out how you actually get this data. Because yes, it could come in line. The easiest way to deal with any of the <laughs> privacy concerns are, well, you know you're receiving the traffic <laughs> because it's coming to you. So now you're just finding out a little bit more about the traffic you were already receiving. The problem is that if you're getting hit with gigabits and gigabits of traffic, you might be dropping individual packets. Yeah, I hope you are. I don't say hope, but I expect you are. Um, you could use DNS. You could declare DNS. <coughs> the reverse DNS space normally just used to provide names for addresses. Could also provide here's where to send tracer data. So we're actually building some code to go ahead and do all this, to collect data streams over GRE, to sign things with crypto keys, you can't just move, oh yeah, I'm totally Verizon moving all this nasty traffic. You should call Verizon. Um, that would be a problem too. So in summary, uh, think globally, think big. We've got a really nasty net out there and as much crap and bad press as it's getting, this thing's actually useful. We kind of run our economy over it. I like an economy. I think people should have jobs. Um, so guys, Keep this thing working.